Hey everybody, it's your old pal Mike. I hope you're happy, healthy, and safe. And welcome back to the channel where the haircuts are getting more desperate and we're gonna be spilling some secrets today. I don't know if you know this about me, but I take a lot of questions on Instagram. My DMs, for example, are so full that I actually can't scroll back past a certain point anymore because it just won't load. Uh, those questions range in topic from guitar repair to what model of jazz master would you recommend to what do you think of new Star Trek series, etc., etc., etc. But one of the questions I get most frequently is what the hell are you playing in that Fender video? If you haven't seen it, many months ago I did a video with Fender, probably my first official video if I'm not mistaken, and it was on the subject of the Vintera Jaguar. It was this lovely ocean turquoise guitar with a tortoiseshell guard, and I opened with something like this. And so between three and five, sometimes 10 times each week, I'll get messages in my Instagram inbox begging to know what that song was, where they can find it, how to play it, or how to make their guitar sound that way. And so that's the subject of today's video. I'm gonna pull back the curtain, show you how the technique works, and also how to set your guitar up so that you too can make wonderful behind the bridge noises. Let's dig in. Hey everybody, it's Mike from the future. Uh, it occurs to me in editing that I actually didn't answer the question of what the song was. And that song happens to be one that I wrote quite a few years ago and never did anything with. It's called Laika, uh, so named after the ill-fated Russian space dog uh, that has a very special place in my heart. Um, and maybe someday I will finish it, but that day is not today. Anyway, I hope you're enjoying the video. Wow, this is hard. There are so many reasons that the Jazzmaster and Jaguar are some of my favorite guitars I've ever owned, but chiefly among them is that length of string behind the bridge. Back here, you can find all sorts of weird resonances. You can bend notes. And if you play with the setup and the intonation and the bridge height, you can get the notes back here that you hear to roughly correspond to notes that you fret. And it's so much fun when you run it through an amp and fuzz and effects and all of that. These sounds are something that I sort of stumbled upon really as soon as I got my first Jazz Master, which was this one back in 2010. But it wasn't until maybe 2012 or 2013 that it sort of started eking its way into my playing style. So I've, I vividly remember the very first time that I realized that the notes that you play back here could directly correspond to notes that you're playing on the fretboard and, and in fact even help you sustain them if you have your guitar set up correctly. Uh, I believe I was subbing in and we were playing a song that had a chord progression that went something like... <laughs> And try as I might, I couldn't figure out a guitar part that accentuated those things. I was looking for something that would help me build intensity and tension as the song built to its final chorus. Um, and I tried everything. I tried effects, I tried pitch, I tried to like play something rhythmic underneath and nothing quite worked. And so out of frustration, I hit a note behind the bridge and I heard my guitar come alive. And that's when it hit me. Oh wow, you can use this like a cello bow. And so we tried that section again and lo and behold, it worked perfectly.
Ever since then, this clanging resonance from behind the bridge has become a huge part of my playing style. And you know me, I'm always trying to make my guitar sound like other things, maybe like a, a water phone or a cello. And I've used these sounds on practically every project I've been a part of since then, including uh, most recently with a band called Fellow Robot, which sadly I'm no longer a part of. However, that sound was a huge part of my guitar playing in that band. Here's a clip of me opening a song while on tour in February. Uh, we were in Seattle this night and my good buddy Martine happened to get some good footage of me plucking behind the bridge on my 1961 Jazzmaster Pancake. In that clip, you can see that I'm fretting a series of notes on the fretboard, but I'm also tremolo picking behind the bridge in order to sustain them. When you pair that with a little bit of compression, some fuzz, and a lot of reverb, you get this moody, sort of cavernous sound that is perfect for setting the tone of a song. Here's another clip of this being used to open a song with my friend Callie Kazoo. Callie is the embodiment of the color seafoam green. She is joyful and jubilant and just one of my favorite people in the world. And her music often sounds like a fusion of Patsy Cline's lyrics and melody with 70s punk rock. Absolutely check her out. Um, but this is us playing a show at Zebulon here in LA. And this sound is just perfect for setting the tone of a set. Check it out. <laughs> And I was also able to use this sound to great effect with my good friend Vanessa. Uh, she goes by the name Vava. Her music is heavily influenced by Brazilian rhythms. And as such, her guitar playing is spindly and it is wiry and it is intricate. She is the best guitar player I know. And I'm so glad that I get to back her up sometimes because I, I, all I do is make weird noises and play power chords. I'm a very ham-fisted guitar player. Uh, so it is a huge honor. But lest I give you the wrong impression, this sound isn't just for these weird tremolo picked, moaning, cavernous sounds. You can also do a lot of really good melodic effects just by plucking notes behind the bridge. Here's a clip of me many years ago recording the song Golden Man with fellow robot. Golden Man is a plaintive sort of cinematic song uh, that I personally love and I, I'm really proud of. But it needed something extra in the chorus, something to kind of elevate and lift. And so I came up with the idea to pluck notes behind the bridge and tune my guitar as I went. And I think what we came up with worked really well. Now that I've given you some examples of how I use that sound, I'm sure some of you might be wondering, well, how can I do that with my own guitar? And there are definitely a few things to consider. First, hardware. Now, if you've seen the Fender video, you'll know that the Ventera Jaguar has vintage style hardware, which includes the floating bridge and the threaded rod saddles for each string. Now, I was actually surprised by how well I was able to set up the Ventera Jaguar to get behind the bridge notes to pop, uh, because the threaded saddles are pretty round, and as such, they make a lot of contact with the underside of the string. And I find that the greater area of contact between the saddle and the string the less you're able to get the notes behind the bridge to pop out. Simply put, I find that it's a lot harder to dial in the notes behind the bridge if you've got a saddle like the original threaded ones or a Mustang bridge because they're making so much more contact than like a mastery or a tunematic. So 
You're not gonna be prevented from getting these notes if you have the original bridge, but a mastery might actually make this a lot easier. And believe it or not, this is a huge reason why I continue to go back to the mastery bridge. It's because of that slim point of contact, the deep grooves in the saddles that keep strings in place. It, overall, it's just a much better bridge for the way I play guitar, but don't let that fool you into thinking you can't use the original bridge. The original bridge, when set up properly, fantastic. The second thing I'd like to point out is setup. With a Jazzmaster or Jaguar, you can absolutely play with overall bridge height, intonation, and even the amount of tilt back on the neck to maximize some of those sympathetic frequencies. I find that there is a sort of window uh, between having the bridge far too low or far too high where the notes behind the bridge just sort of pop out and are at the ready at all times. And when someone doesn't want these frequencies on their guitar, I tell them to keep raising the bridge because once you raise the bridge past a certain point, the strings become taut enough that they don't really respond to what you're playing the way they would with the bridge much lower. I don't know if that makes sense. This is all very nebulous and weird. I'm doing my best. We'll see. Now I have all of my guitars set up differently on purpose to correspond to different notes on the fretboard. R2, for example, the guitar that I'm holding right here, is set up to respond to D, C, and G most readily so that I can get those notes when I need them. Every other guitar I own is a little different and I'll switch through them right now and show you what I mean. Now I've swapped over to Pancake and if you're hearing a little echo, that's because I can't monitor my guitar at the same time that I'm using the mic. So, you know, we're, we're just gonna deal with it. This one is set up to respond to some minor keys such as D. And C. A little bit of G. G is a pretty common note for this to work with. But this isn't only a trick for the low E string. In fact, I use the D and G strings all the time for this sound. Now I've swapped over to my 1963 Fender Jaguar. It's a bit of a project. And this one kind of seems to want to live in the key of A as much as possible. Notes that just kind of jump out are C sharp, and B, and A, and G sharp. And now swapping over to one that I'm pretty sure that you haven't met yet, at least not on YouTube. Uh, this is 3PO. It is the weirdest and most impractical guitar that I own. It has four Curtis Novak pickups, two wide range, one gold foil with the hologram insert in the middle. See if I can get it to change colors. Oh, I love that so much. And most importantly, a lipstick behind the bridge to capture these weird noises, which I will demonstrate here. God, that is so much fun. Oh, I love it. Getting weird sci-fi noises out of your guitar is like the most fun that you can have. Now this guitar tends to live in E flat, again because of Kali Kazoo, uh, who writes a lot with a capo on the third or sixth fret, so I like to keep a guitar in E flat so that I can get uh, below her in terms of frequency ranges. So I'm filling in some of the missing frequencies while she's getting all the high end. And as a result, this guitar sort of responds to some very different frequencies. G, well, these are all half step down, so F sharp. And A, and B, and D. Now that I've taken you on a tour through some of my guitars and which notes they're best suited for, let's move to the workbench and I'll show you how I zero in on those things. All right, so on the bench right now, I've got my 63-65 Jaguar. It's a 63 body with a 65 A neck, as I've said before. A couple of Curtis Novak 12 pickups. It's a really great guitar. Uh, you can see it has uh, <laughs> it's been 
through the ringer a little bit. I'm very hard on my guitars, and this one is no exception. And you can see that most of my guitars actually have wear behind the bridge because of how hard I play back there. Anyway, so I'm gonna show you how I sort of zero in on the notes behind the bridge and make sure that they resonate with things I'm going to play on the fretboard. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that I'm using my little drive-in theater speaker amplifier uh, as my test amp. This is what I have in my workshop uh, so that I can easily test pickups and wiring and electronics and all of that uh, without having to relocate outside of this room. So that's a cool little amp. I find that the most important factor, if you're going to be playing this way, is overall bridge height because it dictates the notes that you're going to get back here. So right now with the Jaguar, I've got sort of a key of A thing going on where uh, the notes that I pluck behind the bridge on the E string sort of correspond to the key of A on the fretboard, like so. You can hear that the guitar just kind of comes alive simply by plucking behind the bridge. But if I pick another note like, I don't know, let's try A sharp, it may not ring out quite as heavily. Still there, but not as powerful as A. And this is generally how I zero in on which frequencies I can expect out of a certain guitar. I let the guitar inform me. But I would say the greatest factor in determining which notes will kind of jump out at you is bridge height. Bridge height can really dictate what's going on behind the bridge as I'll demonstrate here. So we've got that going on. But if I lower the bridge and retune, this is going to mess up my setup, but... <laughs> All right, what do we have? Now we've got the E resonating a little bit more. Well, C sharp is really jumping out at me this time. Let's see if I can get that C sharp a little bit louder raising the bridge a few turns. Mm, I don't like that as much. Let's lower it back down. It's a lot louder now. I've also got the speaker right next to my ear, so I might be hearing it a little bit more than you are. So when you are setting your guitar up and you want to emphasize the notes behind the bridge, play with your overall bridge height, and then if the action is too high after that, or too low, you can shim or remove shims from your neck to kind of help the neck meet its new position. Uh, shimming the neck, I find, doesn't change the overall notes all that much. It just helps with playability. Let's actually see if we can get G to pop out. Can we get G to pop out? Right now, G. Not all that powerful. Let's go lower. Yeah, we're getting more G now. If we go all the way down, and I'm gonna loosen the post bolts on the mastery. Yeah. So let's see, how's that G doing now? Much louder. Let me retighten that post bolt and raise it back up and see if the G kind of disappears. Kind of does, yeah. Kind of goes away. So on this guitar, lower bridge equals more G. Yeah, and it's almost disappeared entirely now that the mastery's raised so far up. So we are going to lower it back down a little bit to probably about where it was. I think my action's probably messed up, but I was going to go through this guy anyway. Anyway, you get the point. Uh, so let's transition back to my seat in front of the amps and we'll keep talking. Now there really are so many other things I could say on this topic and I really could just keep going on and on.
But I'm gonna cut the video off here. I hope that it serves as a primer for you, an encouragement to play around with every bit of string that you have. My favorite thing about the electric guitar is that I really don't believe you could totally master it because there's always a new sound, always a new effect, always a new bit of string that you discover that can be useful for the way that you approach music. So please, have at. The guitar is the most fun I have ever had on this planet, and I hope that it can be that for you as well. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you coming back to the channel, and uh, thank you to everyone who has liked, shared, subscribed, discussed, commented, all of that good stuff. It means so much to me that you keep coming back for more and more weird and hopefully wonderful information. Anyway, I hope that you're staying safe out there and taking care of yourself and each other. Please remember to wear a mask, and we'll see you in the next video.